Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, to paraphrase a famous Canadian, hello Canada and Fields on Wheels fans in the United States and possibly around the world. Uh, this is uh, Headley Ald coming to you, not from the gondola at Maple Leaf Gardens, but from a place adjacent to a snowy garden in Winnipeg. Um, this year we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of Fields on Wheels. And uh, a continuing tradition has been a discussion on grain supply chain logistics. So for this final session four, uh, we've infor invited four all-stars from the uh, grain marketing and grain handling and transportation industry to make presentations on uh, one of three themes. So in the first period, it's where we have been. In the second period, it's where we are. And then in the third period, it's where are we going? So I'd ask you to please refer to your uh, programs for the bios uh, on our speakers. We've got a group of four of them. Um, you are invited to submit questions uh, to our panelists, perhaps through the chat room. Um, and uh, I'll put the questions to our panel as, as we've done with the earlier uh, sessions uh, after all of the uh, four presentations have been made. And uh, also thanks to Canadian Pacific for their financial support to the conference through their sponsorship of this session. So let me move to the first uh, presenter, uh, Mark Hemmes, who is the president of Quorum Corporation. Um, and Mark, uh, it's, uh, your theme is uh, 20 years of progress. And so over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Hedley, uh, is my video, is my audio working? Yes, you are. Uh, yes, it's working. Ah, good. Thank you. <laughs> so, so uh, the fo they, the folks asked me if I would talk about changes in the grain handling and transportation system over the last 25 years. And certainly it is progress that we've seen. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the positive change that has happened in, in almost all the aspects of the grain handling and transportation system over the last 25 years. Uh, I'm going to start out by talking about some of the statistics, uh, production and the supply and, and the country delivery system and the receipt of grain, talk about railway movement and what's happened in the ports and the terminals um, and the vessel performance as we've seen it over the last 25 years. And I'm gonna finish it off by doing a quick run through of some of the more significant events that have happened over the last 25 years. The uh, grain production, as you can see, has gone from 47 to 77. That's 30 million tons more that we're producing. And, and you can attribute that almost entirely to improved agronomics. The, the actual number of a acres that are being used in Western Canada has not increased appreciably, but the yield has. And, and as you can see in this slide, the diversity of the crops has changed considerably. And I think we can also attribute some of that to that change in diversity. In 1999, which is where this graph starts, about 75% of all of the grain that was produced was cereal grains. That's wheat, durum, barley, oats. Uh, and you can see that that's come down to just slightly less than 60% today. And a lot of that growth can be seen in the canola markets and also a significant increase in the special crops, predominantly pulses. The total grain supply, which is what we look at as the grain monitor, because we're most interested in how much grain is available to move, has increased from an average of 56.5 in those first six years to an average of just over 80 million tons. So that puts an incre increased pressure on, on how the whole grain supply chain works. 
Another thing that I, I think is important to note is the change in who's buying Canadian grain. And this, grain go, this graph goes all the way back to 1980. And you can see in those, those first 10 years that are on this graph, a big chunk of our grain was being sold into the Eastern European region, which was the former Soviet Union. And as that market started to disappear and they started to produce their own grains, a lot of that market share started to shift into Asia and Western Hemisphere countries. Also, the Western European grain um, really started to pick up. So we, we've lost some of that market share as well. But the Asia Pacific nations have more than made up for it. And you can really see that in the direction that the grain is traveling. If you went back into 1980, um, the the, the largest proportion of grain that was leaving the country was going through the port of Thunder Bay. Now, when, by the time we got to 1995, um, because those Eastern European markets had disappeared, we started to see this shift towards the West Coast. And you, can, you, you see this predominantly in the last 15 years, especially as the West Coast volumes started to grow and for a time Thunder Bay volumes really started to decrease but that's really come back in the last three years as more and more grain is being shipped into the European countries predominantly Durham and canola I'm sure Tim will talk about that in a, in a minute um, so what's happened in the country well starting right at the farm gate you can you can see a big shift in how grain gets delivered into the country elevator system. Back in the 1980s and early 1990s, the most dominant method of delivering grain was in five ton dump box trucks, um, delivering it at five tons, tons apiece. Now, today, the dominant mode of delivery of grain in the country is done in 43 to 46 ton super B trains or, or large semi trailers. Um, and the network is built for that. One of the other things that we've seen in the country elevator network is if you went back to 1995, most of the elevators out in the country, and there were over 1400 of them, were these old wooden crib elevators that you see on the left side of this picture. Um, slowly, over that period of time, and, and it was starting to happen in the mid 90s, we started to see this transference over to large scale, high throughput elevators, such as that one Richardson elevator that you can see. Um, the, the one in the top right hand corner is the, the Waybird Inland Terminal, which is now owned by Parrish and Heimbecker. And in the last few years, we've seen this new idea of having loop track designs in the country. And that, that picture there is of a, a Green Corp elevator just uh, west of Edmonton. Elevators that are able to handle up to 150 cars at a time, as David mentioned. So we've gone from a period of where a big elevator was able to handle 18 cars, and now we're up to anywhere between 100 and 150 cars in an elevator. The country elevator system has really come down. If you went back into the 1980s, there was over 3,000 of them. In 1995, that had come down to just higher than 1,400. And very quickly, as those wooden crib elevators were eliminated and, and, and the system started to move into concrete elevators, the, the actual count of elevators came down, but the storage capacity, as you can see in that line, while it went down for a while, it's come back up. And today we have well over 9 million tons of country storage available to accept grain in the country. Back then, as I said, there was 1,434 elevators and they were present in, in, in over 750 communities. Today, it's quite a bit more sparse when you look at it on this map, where we have 402 elevators as of last month, and it's in 279 communities. 
it's interesting when you go out and you look at some of these places, places that I'd gone to in the mid 90s in, in uh, my previous incarnations before grain monitoring and even in uh, 2001, 2002, a lot of these towns have since basically disappeared. When the elevator goes, pretty much everything else disappears along with it. But it's a more efficient system. Really quickly, I won't, I won't read off all of this, this change, but you can see that where we went from 10 major grain companies back in 1990 or 1990 in that area, um, through a series of consolidations um, and, and takeovers, we've, we've brought it down to about the, those 10 came down to five. And then we've seen a bunch of new entrants, such as G3, Providence Grain, Grains Connect, um, AGT Foods is also a big player today. And some of those companies have just disappeared. The railway network back in 1980, and, and now I'm going back over 30 years or 40 years, was quite a spider web out in the middle of the, the prairies. And, and, and there was basically only the two railways that were, were in place. Since then, through, through a series of, of um, abandonments and transfers, we end up with a network that looks a lot more colorful today. And the, the, uh, the red and the blue still are the CN and CP, but you can see a lot of colored lines in there. And that was the advent of the short line rail network in, in Western Canada. And now there's, there's, in Canada, there's over 25 of them. In Western Canada, I think we have close to 15. Another big um, change that happened, and, I, and, and this kind of followed suit with the, the elevator system as it changed, the block size of, of railway trains started to change. Um, when we started monitoring the grain handling and system, system back in 2001, we went back to 1999, of course, and almost 80% of all of the traffic that was moving was moving in small blocks, and that's less than 50 cars per train. More often than not, it was less than 25. But as we went through time, as we come up to the last three or four years, it's totally reversed. Only about 20% of the, the traffic that moves uh, is in blocks smaller than 50 cars and 80% of it is in unit train sizes anywhere between 100 cars and 134 cars. Railway car cycles have come down. In, in my railway time, having a 20-day car cycle was pretty typical. And if we got a day lower than that, we thought we'd done something really good. Well, Today, those numbers are, are down considerably, and, and we've seen numbers in the last few years that are as low as 11 and 12 days to go to the West Coast. Um, on average, it's down to about 16%. We went through a period of time where it was down around 14, but in the last few years, it's come back up, but it's still significantly better than what we were seeing back in the mid-1990s. Other railway improvements, and, and, and I, I can't go into the kind of detail that David went into, but the increased loading per car is probably pretty significant. Uh, we've gone from an average of about 80, 85 tons per car to over 94 tons per car. That's largely attributable to a, a lot of the new fleet that's come in in the last few years, in particular in the last two since the MRE was in place. We've seen an increase in the volume commitments that the railways have made, and you can see that in the volume of traffic that they've moved, and, and an increase in the capital improvements on both sides. Grain companies and uh, port terminals in the last five years have put in over $2 billion worth of investment into expanding their terminals and in both the country and at the port. Some of the major advancements in, in terminal designs, and again, something that David mentioned where um, 
port terminals where, where they, they look to expand their throughput capacity have invested in both their car unloading speed as well as the speed at which they load the vessels. Um, typically, back in 1995, the average speed of loading a vessel was about 700 tons per hour. And today, the average would be about 2,300 tons per hour. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a picture of the new G3 terminal out in Vancouver, which was opened just a few months ago. Um, their, their capability of loading at 6,000 tons per hour is pretty significant although I think they're averaging somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 today. They're also capable of taking three full 134 car trains in their loop track, um, which should really lend to an improved efficiency on the West Coast as well. And that's not to mention that all of the other terminals in Vancouver haven't spent considerable amounts of money in improving their storage capacity as well as their throughput capacity. The vessel loading is something that I find very interesting. Um, on the West Coast in particular, what we, we were seeing was around about a 30,000 ton vessel uh, on average in, in the early, 19, uh, early 2000s in that 99 crop year. And it's grown to uh, 50,000 tons where we were normally seeing Handymax vessels were a big ship that was leaving Vancouver or Prince Rupert back then, we're typically seeing Panamax and Panamax Plus vessels leaving now. And, and that increased vessel loading time has really improved to, to help serve some of these vessels so that there really wasn't a deterioration in the vessel loading time. So some of the significant events that we've seen over the last 25 years, and I'm gonna to try to lead you through a timeline fairly quickly on this, but the conversion of the Western Grain Transportation. Your sound's gone, Mark. Oh, is it gone again? Are you back in? Oh, yeah, maybe yeah, it, it's iffy. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, the WGTA was, was changed over in 1995 to the Grain Transportation Office, which lasted for about a year and a half. It basically moved the responsibility of car allocation over to the uh, railways. And it was the period where the grain industry was really starting to get into a larger amount of deregulation. You follow that up right away, there was a bad a crop year, very poor weather, um, and the railways had a, a, a struggle trying to get through that period. Sorry, audio is dropped again there, Mark. If you want to just go back a few seconds. Mark, uh, your audio. It's still, still iffy? Yeah. But I'm going to turn off my uh, my video. Mark, I think we're just nearly coming up to the 20 minute mark. So if you can cut yeah, to the I, end zone. Oh, 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 oh. hopefully this will. So again, S. Day Kruger came along. The legislation was passed, changed the rate structure to the MRE, uh, CWB tendering. Um, we went into the MRE. Um, our program, the Grain Monitor program, was established then. Railway service um, got questioned. There was a real, rail freight service review. Um, there was a one time adjustment to the MRE to account for costs associated with hopper car maintenance. Ocean freight rates had hit a high, then the financial crisis came along and grain volumes decreased. Um, there was a railway freight service review that went on. It was tabled. Uh, the new conservative government brought in moves to eliminate the Canadian wheat board, which was a significant event. Um, and there were the first attempts at establishing railway service level agreements. 
2012, 2013 was the first year without a, the CWB and it was a strong volume year and there wasn't a lot of service problems. Of course, 2013, 14 was, was a year that we'll all remember for a long time. Um, and there was an order in council that was established, extended inner switching. Um, the following year, those mandatory minimum grain volume commitments were taken off. CWB sold to G3. Um, there was a CTA review, which led to the Transportation Modernization Act, uh, which brought in um, long haul inner switching, reciprocal penalties, and, and it split the MRE between the two railways. Um, and then at that same period of time, the Hudson Bay Railway and the Port of Churchill were sold to the Arctic Gateway Group. Um, then kept coming out of that split and the change in the regulations allowed the railways to spend a lot of money on new cars. And we saw the Port of Churchill come back after three years. So there's been more change in the last 25 years and I think in the 50 before it, it's all positive for the better part. A more diversified product mix is, is making for, for more efficiencies and greater volume. It's a new approach to marketing grain than what we'd seen in the past 50 to 75 years. And I think it's allowed for growth that we could not have imagined even 25 years ago. And for Barry's sake, just to mention that container movements, they're up to 11% now. Thank you, Mark. Uh, David was talking about going through 25 years and 20 minutes. I think you did uh, 25 years in about two minutes there. I, I we appreciate you uh, going through that so quickly. Um, our next speaker is uh, John Harmon with uh, Canadian Pacific. Uh, John is the Managing Director of uh, Marketing for the Grain and Fertilizer Business Unit at Canadian Pacific. And uh, uh, I'm gonna pass the, uh, this over to you, John. You might announce where you are. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, thank you. I appreciate it, Headley. My name is John Harmon. I'm the Managing Director of Marketing over in our bulk division at Canadian Pacific Railway, and I'm excited to be here today. Um, let me pull up my presentation here. Uh, before I get into my presentation, I would be remiss if I didn't personally thank all of my CP family that's out there on the front lines every single day, helping feed and fuel the world during this pandemic. Um, we've all had our personal trials and tribulations during this. Some of us are working from home, others back and forth from the office, but uh, I want to express my personal thanks to everyone that's out there on the front lines every day. And what presentation wouldn't be complete without a forward-looking statement in tiny print from our lawyers? Uh, the only thing that would make it better is if it was followed up by a note on non-GAAP measures. But I'll follow up on what Mark just told us about how our industry has evolved over the years. And I'm going to elaborate on where we are today and how we are going to address the continually increasing demand into the future. So I'll cover these eight topics here, safety, grain franchise overview, some successes that we've had with our partners recently, um, what we're seeing for 2021 crop year, um, some of the investments that we've been able to make, what we're looking at for winter, technological investments and sustainability. Let me start by stating the obvious. Grain is very important to CP. It would not be an understatement to say it's the foundation of our business in Western Canada. And in fact, the single largest commodity at CP at 22% of our commodity revenue. It's also a larger percentage of revenue for grain than any other class one railway. Another point worth noting is that CP now has coast-to-coast -coast direct access with our latest acquisition of the CMQ. And through our partnerships with other class one railways and short lines, we extend our customers reach across all of North America. We are really proud that we've maintained the safest train accident record over the last 14 years straight. I wanna spend some time speaking about the future though and how we've made a substantial investment in technology which is driving capacity and, continue, and those safety improvements along with customer satisfaction. Improved reliability and transit consistency allow us to better develop products for our green customers. 
I fully expect these investments to continue to pay off and lead us to zero incidents into the future. This investment requires capital spending, which we will discuss on the next slide. We're always looking for ways to improve shipment reliability, and that's why CP continues to invest heavily in our network. In 2020, we will have spent 1.6 billion back into the areas of infrastructure, rolling stock, and technology. To put that in perspective, we'll spend roughly 20% of our annual revenues on network reinvestment. I think you'd be hard pressed to find many other industries out there where a company spends that much of its revenue uh, on building reliability and efficiency back into their system. The only other industry that I can think of that has even close to that is probably the electrical grid. If we're gonna dive into grain though, that's, more, that's important to all of us, on a little more granular level, CP has a unique grain franchise compared to our competitors. We span the 49th parallel and have access to wheat in Durham, canola, pulse crops and oats in Canada and corn and soybeans in the US. We also have access to grain products like canola oil and meal and ethanol and DDGs in both countries. But even with our franchise spanning the border, we are heavily weighted towards the Canadian grain. Canadian grain makes up about 70% of our grain revenue and regulated grain is about 50% of the total. To give you a sense of the magnitude of it, we ship in excess of 300,000 cars of grain in Canada each year. That's enough cars that if you lined them up in a long train, they'd stretch roughly from Vancouver to New Brunswick and partway back or roughly 5,000 kilometers. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the work we're doing at CP to continually drive the value of our capacity for Western Canadian grain. We're developing our leading, our industry leading 8,500 foot HEP train model and backing it up with an industry leading purchase of new copper cars to serve our green customers, which has led us to achieving many records together. And speaking of that HEP train model, the high efficiency product, the future is now. We've been working on developing this product over the years with our customers and at the same time improving our performance. I'd like to highlight a few of the records that we've been able to set in conjunction with our customers. And thanks to those customers and supply chain partners, we've been able to move 29.52 million metric tons last crop year. This breaks our all time record um, from the of 26.8 million metric tons set in the 1819 crop year. And together last, last crop year we achieved monthly records in nine of the months. We achieved um, the highest volume month ever, which was April 2020 at 2.84 million metric tons and quarterly records in three quarters of, last, of the last crop year. And the highest volume quarter ever happened in Q2 2020 at 8.41 million metric tons. So now let me bring you into the new crop year. Again, thanks to our customers in collaboration with our supply chain partners, the records continue into the 2021 crop year, including the highest volume month ever, which was October at 3.04 million metric tons. Now for six consecutive years, CP has continued to haul more grain each year. And this has been achieved by our service improvements, which are not a recent phenomenon or coincidence of timing. Their planned execution of our PSR model with industry leading products that year after year continue to deliver more capacity to our grain shippers. As companies like Michelle Finlay's Roquette Canada expand across, expand across uh, Canada, CP wants to invest and grow alongside them, but doing so takes additional capacity. Stats Can estimates indicate total Western Canadian grain production to be approximately 76 million metric tons but I've also heard from a large customer that it could be even four to five million metric tons higher. In order to move this large crop, we're targeting 1,100 to 1,150 locomotives in service, up to 15,700 grain hoppers, and 4,350 through 4,420 TYNE employees. As of the close of Grain Shipping Week 18 this year, CP is 15% ahead of last year's volumes crop year to date. This includes both grain and grain products as measured on metric tons. Now, capacity can be added to railways in several ways. Additional track, cars, people, all of which are fairly expensive or in combination with just doing our jobs more efficiently. And as Mark had spoken about how all of our customers are investing in new um, grain elevators and the old wooden ones are coming down, um, that's exactly 
where most of us get the biggest bang for our buck. CP is well resourced and have made significant investments in our covered hopper fleet, locomotives and employees. And we are looking forward to leveraging our investments alongside those of our customers to move this large crop. The latest changes in the Transportation Modernization Act created regulatory certainty for CP, which gave us the financial confidence to purchase our 5,900 new shorter, fatter, and lighter hopper cars for our grain fleet. CP's half billion dollar investment in these cars have enabled us to move 1.6 metric tons more per car on average this crop year alone. Combined with our 8,500 foot HEP train model, we can get 147 of these new cars on one train allowing us to move more than 15,000 metric tons to port at a time. To give you an idea of the incremental gains we've made, just increasing um, the size of the cars on our current train model increased our grain handling per train by 15%. But when you add that to our new 8,500 foot HEP train model, this increases our grain handling per train by over 44%. And this amount of shipping could fill a Panamax vessel in three to four trains rather than five. This will increase the reliability and reduce vessel anchorage. It will also empty elevators faster, making more room for grain deliveries in the peak of grain shipping. Now I wanna talk a little bit more about our HEP train product. In the last crop year, close to 90% of the grain we moved in Canada moved in unit trains. By developing this 8,500 foot power on train in conjunction with our purchase of new hopper cars, CP is significantly increasing our ability to move our customers' grain. As mentioned, the 8,500 foot HEP train is a power on model that minimizes dwell, whereby our crew arrives at the elevator and hands the train over to the elevator crew clear of our main line. The elevator crew loads the train in under 16 hours and then leaves the train aired up and intact clear of the main line for the CP crew to then board and depart. Not breaking up the train in the winter also eliminates delays related to airing up the air brakes and this is key with longer 8,500 foot trains. Customers are also investing in 8,500 foot facilities and any new ones being built to this model are loop tracks typically, but we also have ladder track facilities that have been upgraded to handle this, this size train. These investments are by the industry are producing round trip cycles to Vancouver, which are seven days for the full trip. I've been in the green industry long enough to remember when just getting 14 to 15 days for the same trip was actually groundbreaking. With the expansion of our port terminal partners to accept this length of train, we have an end-to-end -end model that will minimize cycles and maximize productivity for the Canadian farmer. So summing it all up, the combination of changing the regulations enabled our half billion dollar order investment in 5,900 new shorter fatter covered hoppers, which in combination of our customers and supply chain partners investment in the 8,500 foot HEP model enabled our industry to move 44% more grain per train. This is highly important as production continues to increase in Canada and our need for the most efficient supply chain to feed and fuel the world. So that's the future of CP with our customers and supply chain partners are how we're leading the industry towards um, resiliency and enables us to move that much more grain for our customers. That said, there are some seasonal headwinds that railroads typically face with cold weather. Railroads look to, we look to mitigate that, uh, mitigate the impacts of winter through our winter planning for the supply chain each year. This planning helps prepare us for all winter scenarios, thereby ensuring a resilient rail system that can continually serve the needs of our customers and by extension, the needs of the broader economy, even during the harshest winter operating conditions. Over the last few years, CP has expanded winter planning activities and we perform robust winter contingency planning each year that begins in the summer to the to develop these plans for each region, subdivision, rail yard, and facility across the network. We leverage sophisticated weather prediction models to order, in order to predict the actions we need to take to mitigate impacts of weather, like, weather events like La Nina. We will continue to highlight some of these initiative investments and technology that CP is implementing uh, in order to mitigate some of these winter weather uh, impacts and improve our performance. We'll continue to discuss the robust forecasting and predictive winter modeling exercises used by our meteorological specialists to plan for the upcoming winter and our sophisticated use of data analytics and predictive modeling to improve operations uh, and company wide during the winter to ensure that our network is prepared to respond to any adverse winter conditions. 
My counterpart during lunch spoke about train speed and how that is a critical, how it is critical to railroads. I would emphasize that it's critical all throughout the year as well. The industry leverages some traditional tools listed above, as well as some innovative areas uh, CP is actually working on on the next slide. And, but to dive into train speed more, however, it's critical to CP's ability to provide service and maintain throughput capacity, especially during the winter. Every year we invest a significant time, money, effort, and people into managing winter. We leverage standard industry practices like snow plows, switch heaters, avalanche management, and weather monitoring. And on the next slide, I'm going to build upon what Dave Feaster with TELUS was just spoke about regarding leveraging technology going forward. And this is something I am personally, I, I personally geek out about. We're overcoming some of those weather obstacles by using our capital for investment in technological innovation in order to detect and manage network disruptions. At CP, we're at the forefront of developing and deploying these innovations which drives improvement in business processes, which combined with regulatory rule changes and redefining the rail, which are redefining the rail industry. I wanna give you a couple of examples of the ways that CP is developing technology that enables us to better serve our customers while also improving safety. Our team of experts have developed air brake flow monitoring, which is real-time monitoring of locomotive event recorder data to identify trains which cannot maintain a state of air system charge in extreme cold network regions. And this technology once de or was deployed prior to winter of 19, uh, the winter of 1920 and reduced service interruption delay hours by over 50% or approximately 250 hours between January and March of 2020. We're also expanding application of automated train brake effectiveness during uh, our cold wheel detection as we call it technology. We're also expanding ground level air temperature forecast system. So similar to how Terry Shaw with the Manitoba Trucking Association just spoke and how he was looking to record real time weather forecasts on his trucks, CP system models, model correlates general area temperature forecasts with local track level historic temperature to provide a 24 hour forecast of track level ambient temperatures across CP's network. This data helps CP further improve CP, our operational decision making safety and performance. We're leveraging all of this data uh, in, the, in the form of predictive analytics to forecast multiple things. And one of those is rolling stock and equipment failures before they happen. And this, us, using that technology has leveraged or has enabled us to uh, see a 95% reduction in online bad order bearing failures with visibility three months in advance. So one of this patented technology reduced online bearing failures uh, on from average of 60 per month to less than five. And this has greatly helped our customers. And I can tell you from firsthand that we've had a lot of success with this where customers that were shipping loads, um, even hazmat loads, they would get set out in route and then be bad ordered for a while and then try to marry back up with the train. So um, having that preventative maintenance visibility has greatly helped them. Another option or another advancement here you can see on the screen is just a digital representation of our high-speed camera uh, train inspection system. With this one is located on our Ma Maple Creek subdivision in SASC. And this system inspects the train while it's in motion using high resolution cameras and multiple algorithms to assist in identifying defective car components. We're able to identify and address mechanical problems more efficiently, significantly reducing terminal dwell and train cycle times. In-house testing of new air brake valve gasket materials, uh, just by changing the shape of the gaskets, has dramatically improved our ability of those gaskets to maintain air pressure during the frigid cold Canadian winters. We've also invested in our locomotives and we've modernized 201 of them in order to meet the latest em emission and fuel efficiency standards. And we've trained over 400 employees currently in various stages of training system-wide. In addition, we've also started investing more in our communication tools with our customers. So that way there's a two way uh, stream of information. And we do that through our CP customer station as well as APIs. And we're also always concerned about safety. And so we're, we're reinforcing CP's home safe program, whereby we focus on our CP family getting home safely each day to their own families. And I get pretty excited about this because this is game changing for our industry. And it's really exciting to see this being implemented across the board. So we just discussed how mother nature impacts CP and how we leverage technology to prepare for it. Now I'd like to finish with how we impact mother nature. 
Sustainability is important to everyone in ag, and I want to describe how it is also important to CP. We consider locomotive fuel efficiency to be one of the most important elements for both operating cost efficiency and reducing our carbon footprint. Our drive for energy efficiency and emissions reduction focuses on improving fuel economy in our locomotive fleet and freight transportation operations. Since 1990, our locomotive fuel efficiency has improved by 43%. In 2019, our fuel efficiency rate was 10.5% lower than the North American Class 1 freight railway average. By customers leveraging a single unit train, it keeps more than 300 trucks off the road and due to the increased fuel efficiency of rail generating 75% less greenhouse gas emissions, our customers are enjoying that benefit as well. Our 8,500 foot HEP model should only continue to help lighten our footprints on the environment. I'll end with a quote from our CEO, at CP, we have achieved significant emissions reductions through efficient operations and investments in technology and innovation. We recognize that long-term sustainable growth requires an ambitious vision. As we look towards the next stages of our growth, we are building on our culture of innovation to adapt our business and continue to work together with all stakeholders to position CP for a sustainably driven future. I wanna thank you to all the producers out there, our customers and our supply chain partners who enable us at CP to railroad each day. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I'm going to now move on to our uh, next presenter, uh, Tim Haney, who is the uh, CEO of the Port of uh, Thunder Bay. Um, this is, in, again, the middle of the second period. We're talking about uh, the, uh, um, where we are today. And uh, Tim, are you there? And uh, Good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, Thanks very much to Barry for inviting, inviting us to present again this year. And uh, we did our research and decided to take the liberty to change the name of our presentation to uh, Thunder Bay, Manitoba's Port. And you'll see why as we go through the, uh, the slides. Is, is my audio coming through okay? Just fine, thank you. Good. So um, Canada's most efficient rainforest, and we use these measures uh, to highlight that uh, between car cycles, uh, vessel turnaround time, Will you put uh, and our available, available capacity. Um, we also have the lowest harbor dues of any Western Canadian grain port. And combining these things, uh, we've dubbed ourselves uh, Canada's most efficient grain port. Um, yeah, so we'll just go back a little bit to show our title page that we had changed uh, to Manitoba's port and uh, went over some stats about uh, our efficiencies at the port. And then to highlight the size of the port that a lot of people don't appreciate in terms of uh, storage capacity, almost identical to Vancouver after their addition. And uh, we showed a few pictures of the various facilities in the port. Uh, it has the title or in the past of being uh, the world's largest grain port. So this is kind of our legacy of capacity that we still enjoy today. And we've done a theoretical calculation of the remaining capacity in the port. And some of these numbers are based on actual throughputs uh, through some of these facilities during the, the record years in the 80s. So our basic theoretical capacity for the grain terminals themselves are, is around 19 million tons. And the storage capacity in the port is around 1.3, 1.4 million metric tons. So uh, a lot of changes in Thunder Bay happened uh, post wheat board. Thought it'd be worth reviewing a few of them. Um, Many of the costs were eliminated from the system, including the elimination of the Grain Commission inspection on Lakers, that was about 20 million a year. Increased utilization of ocean vessels, particularly for wheat. That was something the wheat board uh, never did do in Thunder Bay, but the ocean vessels here were used for non-board grains uh, during the wheat board times. Um, the, many of the terminals now have eliminated the use of stevedores on ocean vessels and used their own staff for that function. And the movement of vessels around the port has been eliminated. That was about four to five terminals on average 
during the week board days. Today, it's it's rare that you'll see a ship move at all, and it's it's loaded at one terminal. Um, grain terminal utilization. There's a lot of consolidation and purchases. Uh, Richardson's purchased and reopened the Batera C elevator that had been closed. PNH partnered with Cargill in the Superior elevator. And AGT Foods purchased Mobile X Terminal, formerly Valley Camp, and G3 purchased Mission Terminal. In the port, the saying was, it's an industry that nothing changed in 100 years and everything changed in two years. So that was post wheat port, and the changes continue today. Shipments through the grain of grain through Thunder Bay increased by 32%. We have a, a graph kind of illustrating that uh, post wheat board, uh, and that's continuing today. This year is, is quite a remarkable year for the port, particularly given the, the, the pandemic conditions, uh, which probably in some ways led to the increases in grain. But uh, we're going to be over 9 million tons in grain. This is the best year since 97. And we're also seeing the most ocean vessels through the port. Uh, second most in history, actually, in the port at around 160 vessels. So the total cargo ton tonnage in Thunder Bay will exceed 10 million metric tons this, this year for the first time again since 97. And you can see from this graph that the vast majority of shipments through Thunder Bay are grain. And we, we did see decreases in some of our other commodities, including potash and coal. Um, but that was more than offset by the increases in grain through the port. So Thunder Bay is the largest export port on the Seaway system. And that's because most of our cargo is grain that's either transferred in terminals in Quebec by Laker for export or directly exported by ocean vessel. So now we get to some of the interesting numbers we discovered around the Manitoba share of the grain that goes through Thunder Bay. And that's changed quite dramatically, uh, reaching a new peak in, in this year. And uh, this is kind of, uh, it was normally, we're going over 70% now of Manitoba's exports are done through the Port of Thunder Bay. So again, that's one of the reasons we changed our name to Manitoba's Port. It's 74% of the Seaways uh, grain exports are originated now in Manitoba versus 19% uh, coming from Saskatchewan. So we've seen these numbers shift quite dramatically over time. This graph kind of shows that trend and the increase in Manitoba exports. This is done on a crop year. And we, we measure most of our stats on calendar year, but uh, the crop year uh, ending, the year end number at the end of this season will be actually much higher than that for Manitoba, as we're seeing quite a surge from Manitoba right now through the port. So one of the things the Port Authority does in, in Thunder Bay is manage the general cargo terminal. And our main initiative with this terminal has been to increase and diversify cargo through the port, mostly with inbound project cargos and uh, outside cargos such as uh, structural steel and rail originating in Europe and heading to Western Canada. to bring some of those ocean vessels loaded uh, all the way up to the end of the seaway. We're, we're Canada's farthest inland port so we're 2,300 miles from the Atlantic, which is technically farther than crossing the Atlantic uh, to get to Thunder Bay. So we've uh, spent a considerable amount of our own funds uh, modernizing the terminal. It was built to do package freight on the lakes, which really hasn't existed since the 80s. So we've been reconfiguring the terminal to handle more and more uh, project and general cargo. Our latest reconfiguration, we actually were successful for the first time in receiving federal funds from the National Trade Corridors Fund, uh, built further paved laydown areas, a new track spots, and a new heated warehouse facility. So what we do is basically compete with supply chains, um, supply chains that compete with the Seaway for the, our inbound market in Western Canada. And uh, this is something we do mostly with uh, project and general cargo as we're trying to import cargo to match some of our exports. 
some of our uh, shipments that we've had recently, of course, wind turbines has been a mainstay for the port uh, since we got into this business. And uh, we're seeing, we're gonna see a major increase in that next year. Pipe is something we've done uh, on a more regular basis, which was always uh, something we strive to attract to Thunder Bay. Um, structural steel, as I was saying, and oil sands cargo, which has dropped off in recent years. But we are seeing more regular shipments of, of structural steel and rail. And I just wanted to show one of our latest opportunities that took place this month, which is the receipt of phosphate fertilizer for the first time in our history. And uh, we used one of our uh, ClearSpan warehouse buildings and quickly uh, in very short notice uh, developed a system to successfully unlo unload 20,900 tons of a phosphate fertilizer from Morocco. Uh, this transpired as a result of US tariffs uh, going into effect on the phosphate and, and a new interest in the Moroccan market uh, to offset US shipments. It's also in recent years been increasing US rail costs uh, and Mississippi barge costs. So the supply chain in the seaway is gonna be tested to see how competitive we can be. And this market uh, is around 1.3 million tons annually in Western Canada. So we see some pretty good potential uh, to build this business. And that's what we're working on right now. So we're using the building up in the, uh, the far left corner uh, currently for, for the fertilizer. And we're already looking at converting another building, which is almost twice this size uh, for next season. Um, just some pictures of the, of the unload itself, just to show how it was done. Um, significant conveyor systems were brought into the port uh, by our stevedores and set up to uh, effectively handle the ship. So it was loaded, unloaded directly by clam. Uh, again, the clams were brought in from Quebec and uh, loaded to conveyor directly into the shed. Seems like a slow process, but it, it worked out to about 200 tons an hour. And uh, it's similar to most uh, fertilizer operations of this type. Uh, there certainly are purpose-built facilities that can do this more effectively, but I'm told we're not too far off the mark in many, many ports handling it. Given that it's our first try, um, it was, uh, I was impressed with the efficiency in, in short order that they put together to do this work. This conveyor will show you basically the amount from one clam load, which is about 10 tons. So the unloading was done 24 hours a day and uh, helped by our sunny, warm December weather in Thunder Bay. So in summary, um, Port of Thunder Bay is a critical supply chain partner for Manitoba farmers. Shipping increasing volumes of wheat, canola, and soybeans to Europe, the Middle East, North Africa, and Latin America. We have available capacity to handle a significant shift in Eastern grain demand, and we're well suited to increasing cargo diversity. And our latest opportunity is inbound uh, phosphate, which we think, given Manitoba's location, could lead to an increase in trucking of grain to the port and uh, with a ready backhaul of phosphate. Uh, it all can be done within your hours of service uh, between Thunder Bay and Winnipeg. So that's it for my presentation. Well, thank you, Tim. Uh, that's just great. You're right on time. Um, and now let's just turn to our final presenter, uh, who, uh, Neil Townsend, who's the Chief Market, market Analyst for uh, FarmLink Marketing Solutions, and uh, uh, your topic is fits right into this category of where are we going from here? Uh, so uh, are you there, Neil? And uh, I wonder if you can set up your slides. I am here, and I'm just going to be setting up my slides right here. 
yeah. done. Anyways, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for talking to me. I mean, certainly uh, one thing we can say without uh, any, uh, you know, hesitation is that 2020 has been a unique year. Uh, if we were having this conference last year at this time, not many of us would have had the foresight to project um, COVID-19, the incredible challenges that that's had. Uh, you know, I mean, we've had some very interesting sights and sounds and things like that. I mean, I would say, you know, one thing is pretty clear about uh, the state in Western Canada right now is that uh, not enough of us have really been, um, you know, maybe uh, following along with the guidelines because there's still lots of uh, cases out there, still lots of people uh, falling, uh, you know, prey to COVID and going to the, the hospital and the ICUs. And unfortunately, uh, you know, many Manitobans and people in Saskatchewan, Alberta have uh, passed away due to COVID. So, you know, this is uh, a real tragedy. And I mean, one thing I would say too is also, you know, I, I um, maybe missed the aspect of how noble we are. I mean, uh, you know, the minister started this off by saying how many kids we feed all over the world. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to contradict the minister. He's obviously a very accomplished man. But, you know, the vast majority of people are in this business for, for money. Okay, we do it for a living. I mean, that doesn't mean we don't want to do good. But I think the notion that uh, Western Canada is, uh, you know, a beneficial, benevolent, good thing that's just out there trying to feed the world is a little naive. I think we're out there trying to make as much money. And the more that we think a naive thought that Western Canada is just a force for good in the whole world, the more we may be left behind because there's a lot of places that that little kid could get his breakfast cereal from or his breakfast from. Ukraine, Russia, Argentina, Brazil. We all know our competitors and the incentives are exactly the same everywhere on earth. And it takes real leadership, real governance, to kind of battle uh, in a very competitive landscape. And I don't think we should make too many conclusions based on 2020 and say, oh, you know, this is the way it's always gonna be. Because food security um, has become a huge issue this year, not because we didn't grow enough, just because, you know, people were wanting to stockpile and store foods. And there was a few, you know, maybe small missteps in production. But I mean, we really need to be prepared for that. And that's one thing I would say, I think we need to be very careful when we're summarizing what we see, uh, you know, and, and using it as resulting, just saying like, look at the result was good. So, you know, we must have done really great work there. And we may have, but, you know, we need to have like a proper interpretation, a proper assessment of where we are at every stage of the game so that we can build for the future so that we can prepare for the future. And, uh, you know, in times like this in 2020, when it's going to be a very successful year for Western Canadian uh, transportation system, where it's very successful for farmers, you know, we don't want to just say, like, did we take the proper steps? And we heard from CN, we heard from CP today, and they've done a lot of investment. Again, they're not doing it because, you know, they feel uh, great or they're good guys. They're doing it because they want to make money. They might, they might also be good guys, but those two things are somewhat unconnected. And, in, and they are, you know, as more and more of the world is, they are subject to shareholders and shareholder interests. And again, if their company isn't doing what it's needed to be done from a shareholding aspect, then investment money goes elsewhere. So yes, service has been excellent from CN, service has been excellent from CP. Again, the environment has played a, a, an issue as well. We've had, you know, fairly beneficial weather and politics have played, uh, you know, part of it too, because, you know, last year at this time, our major concern were protesters standing on rail lines and the disruption and there had been a rail strike that we had dealt with. So, you know, again, we can't isolate any one crop year and make wide ranging assumptions that that's how it's going to be in the future. And we have to watch very carefully about hindsight bias as well, where, you know, we go back and look at something and we, we, we make a story like we planned it. Nobody planned COVID-19. Nobody planned the supply chain resiliency. The, you know, the number one word of 2020 is resiliency. You know, uh, in fact, resiliency was sort of a forgotten thing for many companies because it was more about just in time and efficiency. Resiliency has kind of jumped back into the highlights. And you know, a lot of companies, not accusing anybody here, but a lot of companies are, are you know, taking a lot of pride in how resilient they are. 
But most analytical approaches would say that actually resiliency was something that was greatly challenged this year because it had not been a priority for the previous five or 10 years when it was all about efficiency. Now, I live by a simple mantra and that's, you know, people are stupid and we make many bad decisions and we fail to under, we fail to take proper assessment of risks and opportunities. We're not good at measuring something that, you know, could offer us something good or something that could offer us something bad and we make bad decisions and collectively we got to combat that and we have to kind of say, how do we not make these bad decisions? And one of the things is just by, you know, not starting the discussion on agriculture and saying that, you know, Western Canadians feed the world. No, we sell into the world. Only a very small fraction of what we sell doesn't go at commercial prices. So if we're just doing commercial prices, I mean, you know, again, we might be great guys. We might love the world, but we're also business people and we're businessmen or women. The incentives are known. And, you know, this is the, the big story of the last 10 years, I think, is just how much improvement there's been in farm practice, business practice, logistics practice, it, all around the world. They've gotten better at it. The Russians have gotten better at it. The Ukrainians have gotten better at it. The Europeans have gotten better at it. The Chinese have gotten better at it. So, you know, we have a lot of competition in the world and it's a highly interconnected wor world. One of the huge failings probably of COVID-19 in 2020 was just how, you know, at each other's throats, a lot of the nations were. And we saw that that, you know, prevented some mitigation of the events that happened in 2020. Politics matter. Again, you know, we've seen that in Western Canada with the detention of Meng, the Huawei CFO in Vancouver. Uh, you know, a lot of people have made the misapprehension that, you know, somehow she could just be freed or whatever. I mean, it's a process. It's a, it's basically, a, you know, an a extradition hearing. The other thing I think that's quite concerning if you were a Western Canadian and a Can Canada, which tends to enjoy multilateralism, like getting everybody at the table and everybody kind of deciding on the future or the patterns or the rules and the regulations of the world, the world has really broken apart into more of a bilateral thing. And we've seen, you know, uh, Brexit, we've seen the US uh, walk away from the TPP. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of question marks. And I think that's one of the huge things as we go forward is how will market access be maintained in, in times of trouble? And a lot of people think, oh, you know, the Indians, for example, they're making policy, you know, based on what's happening in Canada. No, they make policy based on what's happening in India. So, you know, at times they want to speed up import flow because they're concerned about food security. And other times they want to slow down import flow because they're concerned about income security. And there's massive protests there right now. And again, our prime minister, I mean, I guess he made a bit of a misstep by sort of, you know, involving himself even tangentially in domestic politics in India and seeming to side with the farmers. I mean, obviously, you know, he probably should have just, you know, maybe kept his mouth uh, shut on that, that front. Yield is king. I mean, this has been mentioned by many of the presenters today, just how much more volume of grains and oil seeds are out there. Um, you know, Dave Shinovic mentioned how, you know, the trend was going to continue and also that, you know, summer fallow has become sort of a, a dinosaur. There isn't that much summer fallow anymore. Again, yield is king, not just in Canada, but around the world as well. And that's one of the challenges I think we're going to face is that as farm practice, as investment picks up around the world, we're going to see not just the traditional competitors, but potentially even more competitors enter the fray. And why? Because we've shown them that, you know, you can make money doing this. And again, this goes back to the whole notion that Western Canada is not some benevolent master plan. We're trying to make money and our farmers are successful because they've made the investments. Companies are successful because they've made the investments. And, you know, the weather has to comply it to a certain Consumer, we haven't spent too much time talking about the consumer here, but the consumer is an interesting, you know, lesson in, in what do they want? What will they want, uh, you know, going forward? And, you know, you just look at one of our core constituent products in Western Canada, canola. And canola, you know, here we consider it healthy. We consider it heart healthy. You go just over to Europe, the European Union, they don't consider it heart healthy. They don't consider it, you know, a, a good a good product. And then we've had, you know, issues with wheat belly and types of those types of things. Then pulses are, 
right now considered to be you know extremely healthy the non you know non meat based proteins are very exciting and we've seen lots of investment in western canada and again that's in, in anticipation of a growing market and you know that's exactly what we need to do plan for the future the climate now that was covered extensively and extremely well by Danny Blair and uh, the other gentleman was uh, Graham Parsons. Uh, I won't go into it too much, but I, I think that one thing you know we need to talk about when we talk about the climate is we still have a constituent in Western Canada who tends to vote for a party or a personality in those parties that mitigate the impact of climate change. And I believe quite sincerely, quite strongly, that climate change will be the number one challenge that we face in Western Canada and globally over the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. And I really welcome we, uh, you know, Fields on Wheels, an agricultural conference of actually like addressing it right at the top in, in you know, the best spot when you know, there weren't 75 or 80 people left. The, the most people were still in the conference, not Friday afternoon. And I think that's where it should be on the agenda in all agricultural conferences. And then China, I mean, China for a long time, it's that sort of story, you know, when you're tucking your kids into bed in Western Canada and you're talking about, you know, your 10,000 acres and how much you're gonna grow and the little kid says, but, but daddy, where's everything gonna go? And it's just like China, China is gonna eat it all up, son. We just have to produce as much as possible. But China is not staying static. China will not be the same China in 20 years. China will not be the same China in 30 or 40 years. So we need to prepare for that. So yield is king. I mean, I don't need to talk too much about this, but just some of the things that I hear when I go out into the country now, yields of offset prices. Now this year we've got good yields and good prices. Uh, farmers are satisfied with yields. There's not a lot of general complaints about the way crops are yielding. Uh, lots of investment in on-farm infrastructure to accommodate the yields. Uh, we have above average to strong farm practice in Western Canada. It's getting better every year. And it's getting better every year and all of our competitors and many of our non-competitors farm practices is increasing as well. Farmers still complain about the costs. Uh, that was very interesting uh, from, from Tim, the last presentation about the phosphate coming into uh, Thunder Bay there. Uh, you know, so we still are, we have to buy a lot of our fertilizers and a lot of our machineries from offshore places. Uh, and, and those costs are high. Uh, you know, again, the sort of traditional what you need to make or break it is is going up. So, you know, in the old days, maybe you talked about a 35 bushel an acre yield for something. Now you talk about a 40 or 50 bushel an acre yield for something. And, uh, you know, some of the old timers say, even when it's ugly, it's double what it was 10 years ago. And that's one thing we're getting not particularly great at projecting what the crop size is. Uh, FarmLink, the company I work for, we run a crop tour during the middle of the summer. I'm always shocked that there's not more interest in it because I would think that would be the first step to sort of preparing what we see. And, and, you know, this year we took a lot of flack for our wheat number. And then, you know, as we've progressed, that wheat number has got closer and closer and closer to the number that we gave out. Uh, bulk capacity, we've, we've heard from, you know, again, Thunder Bay, Vancouver, these places, and lots of investment. We've got all the new uh, facilities out there. Uh, container facilities are being built. Now there's a big shortage in containers right now, but, it, you know, we're, we're clicking along. We live in the post-ethanol era. That's one thing. Like we haven't seen any major change. China's talked about it in the last few years, but we haven't seen any major change in the mandates. But you know, all of the technology and all of the investment people made into seeds have sort of you know come into the post-ethanol era. And the only acre with no potential is the acre that does not get planted. So right now we're watching South America, and you know people are wondering about the weather down there. It's probably too early to talk about it, but the point is, is that type of crop that we have now and we've had for the last five or six years is a crop that really weathers some adversity and uh, you know that they can get through it and the competitors are making those advances. Now just moving quickly to the consumer I think the consumer is changing. First of all the consumer is on average aging in a lot of the sort of traditional markets uh, you know North America, European Union and China in particular. This is an older consumer uh, you know, they're, they're shifting away from some of the things that they aid into other things, a little bit more concerned about health. Uh, you know, and, and COVID-19, it's kind of probably threw off some trends and accelerated others. 
One thing I'd say is, are we better informed? There's a lot of noise about what you eat, what you want to eat. I think uh, the notion of clean is something that we're going to be, you know, working towards. And again, 2020, we probably saw less concern about these types of things just because people were more concerned about having food on the shelf, pantry preparedness. But when times get, you know, when we get rid of COVID-19 or mitigated enough so that we go back to, you know, quote unquote normal, I think we'll see more of these sort of buying decisions being made. And, you know, it's just like, virtue signaling. And again, I, I think I don't know why the agricultural industry feels it's so necessary to virtue signal just about everything, uh, you know, probably because there is a sense of guilt there. But you know, a lot of people are now virtue eating. And again, it doesn't happen if it's not posted on Twitter or Facebook. But you know, you want to not just be, uh, you know, healthy and happy, you also want to be eating the right food. And again, if this trend takes place, and I can see that lots of our you know, lots of companies are prepared for this because, you know, they're, they're very good at presenting themselves as being, you know, virtuous. And it's, it's, it's critical because the consumer tends to be more concerned about issues than maybe other people in the supply chain. So climate change is one where I think the consumers can really drive people to make the right decisions there if the consumers become more concerned about it. But we can see that one problem is that as soon as food prices go up, you know, a lot of your ethics about eating sort of go out the door because, I mean, it becomes more about survival and affordability. And this is probably one of the struggles we'll see on and off going forward for many years. And again, the future consumer for, from a Canadian perspective, and I think this is why it's so amazing that, you know, there's more investments being made in uh, Thunder Bay and the Eastern Channel is being built up again is because I think a lot of the future consumers, like where the populations are growing, where the capacity of the land to produce a crop is going to be under strain from climate change, is in places like, you know, the Middle East, the Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa. And a lot of that is sort of, you know, uh, a good uh, a focal point for ships to come in and out of the St. Lawrence Seaway and and go down there. Now, it doesn't mean Vancouver is not going to be a, a great hub or Western movement's not going to be key, but it's just going to be like, you know, maybe if we go forward 10 or 15 years, a, a higher percentage of our output from Western Canada is going to be shipped to, uh, you know, the Middle East region or, you know, other areas and not necessarily towards China and, and Asia. And then the climate, I won't go into this very much because it was covered very well. Again, I think Fields on Wheels did a brilliant job of bringing together people to talk about it. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, but I will just show you this. This is uh, the temperature in, uh, where is this temperate paradise? And this was Churchill, Manitoba on December 7th and December 8th with a zero degree Celsius. So, you know, again, the weather is not the climate. I understand that. It's only a component of the climate, but something's going on. And I mean, you know, I, I think, again, I, I really, really enjoyed uh, Mr. Blair's uh, discussion or Dr. Blair's discussion. I, I think that was excellent. And I highly uh, encourage people to look at that. Uh, you know, it's covered very well today. And I'll just comment one thing about the peak decade. This was something that came out of Davos in early 2020, before we knew that we were going to kind of be uh, you know, ravaged by uh, COVID-19. And a lot of people were talking about, you know, because in Davos, again, there's a lot of self-congratulatory people there saying that they're great corporate citizens or great world citizens, uh, you know, but, you know, it's sort of trickled down. Maybe they give some good ideas, but it's up to the rest of us to really pay for it. But the peak decade, and one of the concepts that came out of there was peak consumption. Now, there is a certain logic to it because, you know, the world is may not quite get to as high of a population as people are predicting. Birth rates are falling very fast, very steadily. And again, we are an aging world. And in certain countries, we're aging very, very fast, which leads me to China. And I think China is one of these countries that, you know, this year they have come in for a lot of product. They've, they've been very bullish buyers of you know, canola, uh, barley, uh, they're in sort of a political squabble with countries like Canada on one, is one hand, but with Australia on the other hand. But the demographics of China are going to pose an enormous challenge, I think, to Western Canada and probably to the United States and other exporting countries because some of the demand bases that have grown there just are going to be unsustainable 
And we're going to start to see a shift, like, you know, not maybe in the next two or three years, but certainly more of an impact in the next five or 10 years. And again, I think we have built a lot of apparatus or we have built a sort of a sense in farmers and a sense in Western Canadian agriculture that, you know, China is this, if we can just get all market access to China, it will be like a never ending, you know, flow of goods into China. And I mean, I'll leave this to you to kind of look at yourself, but I mean, you know, first of all, China's population is set to decline. Many people think it's going to de decline much faster than sort of the projection here. Uh, you know, some, like I think uh, the United Nations did a big study in sort of their, their midway mark for what China's population will be in 2100 is something like 700 million people. Uh, so, you know, that's a considerable difference. And now, again, 2100 is a long way out, but 2050 isn't that far away now, or 2030, 2040 is not that long way, way away. And the point is, is that, you know, you don't suddenly just, you know, turn over these pyramids like this, but you get this kind of uh, system that's building up in terms of the population and, and the shift is, is more dynamic than you think. And we've seen with Japan, for example, where sort of a stagnant uh, population growth and just what that kind of impact that's had on their economy over a long time. So yes, China continues to grow now. They continue to be a very successful economy in the world. And I'm not projecting in any way, shape or form that they won't continue to do that. I just don't think that their, you know, their food demand is going to be growing exponentially like we've seen it growing in the last 30 or 40 years. And that sort of tipping point may happen sooner than we think. And already China, I mean, you know, if you just read what President Xi has been talking about and different policies is there's a lot of efforts in to, to become more efficient in agriculture, to, uh, you know, amalgamate land and farm it better. And, you know, one thing I say, I mean, I don't know how many people are left here, but let's say there's 80 people left or 75 people left. But if I were to bring 75 farmers from the northeast part of China and have them join our meeting today, I would raise the average age of our meeting by, you know, 10 or 12 years. I mean, it's a very, very old area, and there's no follow-up generation to farm the, the land like those farmers farmed. It's going to be amalgamated. It's going to be brought into, you know, uh, like bigger, more efficient productions, more mechanization, more technology. And, you know, again, the productive capacity of China probably depends, you know, obviously weather in, in the broadest sense, but on water. And water may be the X factor where they just don't have the water that, you know, available to get the yields that, that we get. And then just, you know, one thing I'll mention about the northeast part of China is, you know, it's sort of where industrialization happened first, but it has the world's lowest observable fertility rate right now. And it's a fertility rate that was observed only in times of, you know, enormous stress, like a, like a prolonged drought or war. And neither of those things are happening in those provinces right now. It's just, you know, it's an aging area. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like uh, China's version of the scorched earth, you know, of, uh, you know, northern New York, uh, Pennsylvania, those types of places where the industrialization happened there first. And then people have moved the younger people have moved to where the better opportunity is now. And China has pledged to create 67 million hectares, uh, something that happened again just in the early days of 2020 and was missed because of uh, the whole COVID-19 was that China's saying they're gonna adopt GMOs for corn and soybeans. And again, we just look at this chart and we see that you know the US is averaging about 167 bushels an acre for corn and China's down here at 100. And if they get to 130 or they got to 140, I mean, there's significant Im implications for that. So broadly speaking, just conclusions here. Yesterday is not always a good prediction of tomorrow. I just want to kind of, uh, you know, I think everybody probably knows that, but I mean, we need to have more rigor in, you know, seeing what we did, why we did it, and then not equating, you know, a good result for bad reasons or a bad result for good reasons. We need to have to look through that and to continue on, formulate a plan and, you know, think, think longer term, build what we need, not what we needed. Change is inevitable. Categories are not mutual ex mutually exclusive, meaning that, you know, sometimes a lot of these different things that seem to be challenges, they're actually layered on top of each other and you know, uh, they play into each other. And in other words, we're going to get hit by a lot of different vectors coming all at once. 
Uh, trade tensions and wars cause grief. So I think, you know, one thing that probably needs to be reset in the world circa 2020 or 2021 is to get back to a bit more multicultural, uh, multilateral uh, agreement to have people work together. And I think for the big existential challenge of our time, global climate change, it's going to demand it. And if we can't work together, if we can't find uh, you know, a reason to work on that front, it's going to be difficult. And I think that one of the big threats of climate change is that, you know, we see increased tensions, increased, uh, you know, maybe not like actual fighting, but it could be actual fighting, but more, you know, uh, if you have something, we don't have something, and that's going to cause some trouble, and it may cause market access issues, etc. cetera. Uh, my opinion, geopolitics should be about cooperation, win-win, and I think we've seen a lot in the past where, you know, the sort of, we like to think of a Canadian reasonableness, isn't that appealing to some of the other countries that we are talking with. And I'm not to say that Canada's, you know, without blame. I mean, you know, I'm sure if we had somebody presenting from Saudi Arabia or from China, they would say that we are very much to blame. But I just say that I think we need to try to keep going down a path where we show that, you know, there's a win-win for people to cooperate. And you know, again, that's not in any way to shape or form to advocate that we uh, deal with countries that are making, you know, uh, extreme uh, human rights abuses or those kinds of things. I'm just saying that, you know, when we're talking about trade or we're talking about market access with a country like India, I mean, I think we can show them how, you know, there's a win-win situation if, if Canada has market access and they can have reciprocal market access for some other things that they have comparative advantage for. And it might help and improve a lot of the things that they're worried about in India as well. We live in a very interconnected world. The incentives are known everywhere. There's no mystery. Like, you know, people know what the price of corn is. People know what the price of soybeans are. People know what the price of canola is, except for Western Canadian farmers, because um, there's not much transparency here. But I mean, that was a joke. Incentives are known everywhere. And that's the one thing, like if we feel that we're doing some form of business that is, you know, good to do, making people money, helping the world, whatever you want to do to make yourself sleep at night, then, you know, our Russian friends, our Ukrainian friends, our Brazilian friends, our Argentinian friends, South African friends, they're all going to know about it. They're all going to be, okay, if, if the weather can cooperate, if the logistics system can cooperate, you know, we are going to also try to exploit that and try to make you know, money on that. And that's the whole sort of, you know, what happens to profits is they end up getting zeroed out and with the world the way it is now with, you know, available money for farming, available money to improve logistical systems, uh, you know, there is a lot of incentive being grabbed. And that's the one thing. Canada is making investments. We needed to make investments. And we're going to continue to have to make investments because it's a very competitive world. Strategic, strategic adaption is critical. We need to build for tomorrow, not today. Or worse yet, we don't want to build what we needed yesterday. And with those comments, I am done. Thank you very much for your time. That's a real tour de force, uh, Neil, that you've put together today. Thank you for that. And it, it, it's, a, it's an energetic uh, wrap up to a session. Uh, you were full value for, uh, uh, for looking at the future and uh, um, the, 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 uh, in, indeed of uh, the failure of uh, extrapolating trends uh, forward. It reminds me of something what I was reflecting on with David's presentation at noon today that I remember going back to about 1980 and there were uh, there was discussion about running out of capacity in Western Canada for the railways to the West Coast at that time and um, talking about continued extrapolation of growth rates in uh, in coal exports and in uh, in potash exports in the in the early 80s. And uh, it, had, it never came to pass. The capacity was built, but uh, we, we were living off that capacity perhaps for another 10 years before finally we had another uh, export surge. But um, I've got a few questions that have come from, uh, from the floor, if you will. Um, and I, I'm gonna, uh, I think I'll address the first one to you, Neil, about this one. Just in terms of trade dislocations, um, Brexit is, uh, uh, is imminent, um, and uh, you mentioned it. Do you think that uh, when the dust settles that the UK 
will again open up as a better market for Canadian grain. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we have longstanding relationships with, uh, with Great Britain or the UK, uh, Warburton's and those types of things. In various times, they've taken more of our grain. They do grow quite a bit of grain themselves. Uh, one interesting aspect about the United Kingdom and their breakaway from Brexit is it's allowing them to transform their agricultural policy very controversially away from sort of the traditional supports, market-based supports that the European Union uses. And the new standard in the UK is going to be uh, about what degree of damage or lack of damage do you do to the environment. And of course, many of the farmers who voted for Brexit are now very regretful of voting for Brexit because of the standard. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing how that unfolds, because will that mean that, you know, there's going to be uh, less productive capacity in the United Kingdom? Will that mean that, you know, we have to backfill for some of the things that they, they grow they, and, you know, just those types of things. Now, again, uh, you know, they do have a, for a small island, they have a fairly large productive capacity. Uh, and we'll just have to watch what happens with that there. Um, here's another question. Um, and I, three guesses where this might have, uh, this question might have come from. The containerization of grain continues to grow. Are we nearing a tipping point? And what's that tipping point? Is it going up or going down? Uh, Mark, would you li could, like to respond to that for your first crack? Yeah, I can guess where that came from. Um, can you hear me? Um, yes, start. we can. The, it's interesting, about three years ago, we hit a peak and it actually went up to almost 14% and it's been sliding back down again, but it's a proportionate number. Uh, as, as production and grain supply increases, uh, it, it's one of those cases of where a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, so the amount of grain that's going to go into containers is going to be wholly dependent on the amount of demand from the buyer. And, and there are, you know, an increasing number of buyers who want to buy in smaller lots. And that's what drives a lot of the, the containerized grain movement. Um, that it, it's particularly uh, useful for somebody in the special crops industry to, who wants to sell in sm smaller lots because the buyers are looking for it in, you know, anywhere between a thousand tons, maybe up to three thousand tons, something that's smaller than the hold of a ship. Um, when it comes to bulk grain such as wheat, durum. Um, plain seed barley, uh, canola, that sort of thing where, where buyers are buying in lots of 50 or 100,000 tons in a shot. Containerized grain just doesn't, doesn't cut it because the economics just don't pencil out for that. Bulk movement will always be king. Um, the second part of that is, is that, uh, um, and, and I know that Barry, Barry's line for a while there was, we see all these empty containers flowing back to the port, we should stop them and load them with grain. The problem with that is, is that um, the, the weight ratio on, and, and Barry and I have had this discussion before, uh, you can't load a container ship full of containers that are have bulk commodities in it, whether it's grain or forest products or or whatever, because the boat will sink. It's pretty much that simple because they're not built for that kind of weight. The average weight per TEU is usually around 10 to 11 tons per TEU. You load a, a container, it's got 23 to 28 tons in it. Um, so the, the math doesn't, doesn't work on it. Also containers, container movement, even at a backhaul rate, is more expensive than what bulk will be. So bulk will always be king. And 
just because the economics drive it. Would, would anybody else like to take a crack of that at, uh, on the panel? I've got another question here um, regarding India. India came up uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the discussion in the panel. Uh, do we know what's driving the change in India's agricultural policy uh, uh, over the last uh, over the last month or so, Ian or, or Neil? Money. It's very expensive to you know use the the means which they've been using in the last while. And uh, again, I think that you know Indian policy is a challenge for Canadians to understand at times, but you know, they govern for India and Indians. And I mean, COVID has been a, you know, a very um, challenging time for them at various points in time, almost 800 million Indians got some form of food aid, uh, you know, um, and again, that issue of food aid is a humongous issue around the world right now. And, you know, that's kind of why Maybe my comments sounded harsh at the start, a start about sort of the virtue signaling, but you know, uh, we are benefiting greatly from prices rising because of pantry preparedness and certain things. Uh, you know, we have excess here, uh, you know, and again, like, you know, I know Barry loves the, the airships. And I just saying like, you know, at any point in time, if we made it a priority to lower food prices in Nunavut, you know, we could definitely lower food prices in Nunavut. It's just not a priority. And I think that's what's happening in India now is that, you know, they've realized that their policy is costing them a lot of money. And, you know, why do something uh, that costs them a lot of money when, you know, the private market will take care of that. And I mean, you know, unfortunately, the Indian farmer who is, uh, you know, um, maybe not all farms in India are what we would call an economically viable unit. And that's in no way, shape or form to criticize the Indian farmer. Just saying that they have a problem that Canada, the opposite problem that Canada has is their farms are getting smaller because they're dividing them between more and more sons or daughters or whatever. Whereas our farms are amalgamating and getting larger. And again, even if you're a very, very good farmer in India, it can be a financial hardship. And, and again, the government's maybe trying to get out of that business. That's a long answer, but that's my. Um, are there any other questions? Just use your uh, chat room to, uh, uh, to forward them to me. I, I've gone through those. Um, I, I just, uh, Neil, you and I yesterday when we spoke in advance of this, we're talking about the demographics of China. And I see that you put up a very interesting slide near the end there about, uh, Perhaps it's, it's either the consequence of the one-child policy or it's a consequence of affluence. But you, could you just elaborate a little bit about what you were saying at the very end there about the, uh, uh, the, the, what you can see as the, the, the change in the demographics and perhaps the economics of China's own domestic agricultural production? Yeah, and I mean, I'm not a demographer, but I've, I've read many. But if I had to summarize it, I'd say that, you know, their one child policy was uh, incredibly successful and was probably prolonged too long and had too deep of an impact on sort of building up a replacement population. And, you know, most modeling of China now says that, you know, they're going to be significantly underweighted in terms of young people for the next like 30 or 40 years to the portion of people who are sort of like going through the system, call them, you know, baby boomers or whatever they had, like pre, uh, pre one child policy, right? And, uh, you know, China has also sort of like embarked on efforts to get people to have more children because they realize this deficit and it's not really being successful because again, as you mentioned, affluence or urbanization, those kinds of things. And I think that's one of the things, I, I can't remember who spoke about it, but, um, one speaker was speaking about losing some arable land in China to um, urbanization, but urbanization is also, you know, an incredible threat to sort of countries maintaining replacement populations. And what they've observed in places like, you know, even Nigeria and those kinds of things is once you bring people into the city, the birth rates really start to drop 
quite far. And if you just isolate certain urban areas and countries we think of as being, you know, overrun with people, actually the urban areas are starting to exhibit, you know, below replacement level uh, birth rates. So, uh, you know, it's going to be a challenge. And again, like, you know, smarter people than myself, for example, in the United Nations, they did like a, you know, a medium, uh, a low and a high estimate for China's population. And I think by 2100, even the high estimate is something like 850 million. And the median estimate is maybe 700, but the low estimate is like, you know, 540 million or something like that. So, uh, you know, the experience I think with Japan is once you sort of stagnate and you don't have uh, progressive sort of immigration policies, you know, it's very difficult to sort of uh, alter the landscape. And, and we've just seen in, in you know, Japan, they, their basic policy over the last 30 years has been to try to create inflation, to create consumer spending, and, and largely it hasn't been successful, right? So, you know, that's why it's important for them to trade. Uh, obviously, it's important for everybody to trade, but I just think that that's going to pose some challenges. And a lot of the sort of countries that we're used to doing a lot of shipping to, you know, particularly from the West Coast, like, you know, uh, Korea, um, Japan, uh, China, they all have very similar demographic paths. And, uh, you know, even the European Union, a lot of countries there that, you know, we have shipped uh, goods and services to over the years, they also have a similar uh, path in terms of demographics, maybe aided and abetted by a more liberal policy on immigration than Japan, Korea, or China. But we'll just have to wait to see, but it's going to be transformational, I think. And again, I think very, very few people on earth right now, if you think of the world kind of, you know, uh, trying to build the middle class up bigger, very few people on earth are getting a price signal to have more children. Life is expensive. So, you know, if you're trying to have, you know, two or three kids, and you want to put them through university, buy them their cell phones, you know, get the PS5 that's like $1,000, you know, because you can't get them or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. And I think those are the exact same challenges that people face in places like China, Japan, uh, Korea, European Union, and increasingly in urban settings in India and other places where they're saying like, you know, I, I got to put all of my eggs in sort of a one basket and have two kids or three kids at most. And, uh, you know, I think the planet is going to thin out far faster than we think it will, except for in critical countries which have the most environmental strain projected due to climate change, like, you know, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, uh, you know, the Middle East, where, you know, the, the birth rates there are still much higher than they are elsewhere. And yet the available resources to, say, feed themselves and, and you know, keep keep water, fresh water in a, enough supply. There's a lot of challenges there too. And I think that's where Canada is uniquely placed. And, you know, Tim in, in uh, the port of Thunder Bay is, uh, is excellently placed is to, is to serve those kind of, uh, you know, um, countries and, and to continue to trade in, in, into there. Tim, any, uh, anything to add on on that? Uh, you'll have to maybe hit your microphone. Uh, yeah, certainly we've known for some time that uh, urbanization drives uh, also grain consumption. And, uh, you know, it was interesting to see the presentation there about uh, the Middle East and Africa. And uh, we've been touting that for quite some time in our presentations as well. So uh, to be in Thunder Bay in the port, you have to be patient. So, but do, good things do come to you over time. I've got a question, a couple of questions here, for John, for, on uh, the discussion of technology. And uh, John, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Um, one was related to the um, uh, the high tech um, uh, car inspection and and track inspection technologies. Uh, the question is: do, do you see that as being driven by safety, by uh, productivity or by capacity uh, as, as the justification for the business case for these kinds of investments. And then I've got a follow-on question related to distrib distributed power. Sure, thank you for the question there. Um, I would say it's all of the above. So it does definitely improve safety because it'll catch more than an inspector will catch traditionally. Plus it's faster. So a train in motion 
can actually be inspected versus having to have that train stopped. And it's also enabling us to run a little bit longer before we have to stop the train again. Um, so that increases our capacity dramatically. So it's a combination of all three of those. And then on, on the distributed power, um, does distributed power and, and maybe the use of unit trains uh, offset the loss of productivity that's traditionally uh, experienced in the winter months? Or um, is it, 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 does it augment uh, capacity that's otherwise lost? Or is it only suitable in the situations where distributed power can be used? Is it, is it limited to those applications? Good question. So distributed power typically helps during the winter because traditionally it's the air pressure all the way throughout the train that has to be maintained in order to properly work the air brakes. And so in the winter, you typically have the glad hands come together and the gaskets typically shrink to a certain degree. So one of the things that we're trying to do that we've done a lot of in-house testing on is coming up with different shaped gaskets that when they do shrink due to the cold weather, they don't lose their air pressure. Now, you still would like to put uh, a locomotive on each end so that way they're powering air from both sides to keep that air pressure up versus just at the head end going all the way down. Um, and so are unit trains better or worse during the winter? It, it depends um, is, the, is the best answer I probably have for you. But distributed power helps keep the train um, longer during the winter. Barry, I think we've just uh, winding down the the uh, with the questions for this panel. Um, are you uh, um, are in a position to uh, uh, take over the wrap up of the session here? <laughs> thank you very much, Hendley. Yes, uh, and thank you to the panel. Uh, that was really interesting, and uh, I really appreciate the, your time and and your efforts, and and uh, in particular, Tim. Manitoba's port, well, why didn't we think of that a long time ago, I guess, eh? Uh, we just need to augment Northwest Ontario into Manitoba somehow as, uh, you know, that was been a dream that uh, some people had uh, some time ago. Uh, so uh, this has been a great day. And uh, I just, uh, you know, in closing, I want to extend some thanks to some people who are, were really behind this. But first of all, let's talk about our sponsors because uh, without our sponsors, these sorts of events aren't possible. So CN and CP Rail uh, came through for us uh, again, and, and, and many thanks to you as, as you've been very long-standing and traditional supporters, as well as the province of Manitoba. And of course, the Port of Montreal and, and the Port of Thunder Bay, uh, we really appreciate the, the link uh, beyond our, our the Port of, Man of Manitoba. It, it really does... Uh, feel that way. And Montreal is uh, the Port of Manitoba too. We shouldn't forget them. Plus the St. Lawrence Seaway. So these are our sponsors, including the canola growers. And, uh, and we really appreciate all of your help. Plus, of course, the team that put this all together. And the, the chairs who uh, serve today, Bruno and Steve and, and Derek and, and Headley. And, and of course, I also want to give a special thanks out to Mark Hemis as well, because Mark was part of that informal industry group that helped us identify what are the topics that we really should be addressing uh, this year in the fields on wheels. Uh, how did I not think about airships? Well, one of these years, we're definitely going to have the airships on the program. I, I'm going to guarantee you that. And finally, uh, and, and the ones who really were the, the people in the background doing a lot of this work, uh, I have to give a shout out to, to Siobhan and to Rihanna and to Stacky and Crystal uh, for getting the program out and, and letting everybody know so that they could attend. And of course, our technical expertise from Chris and, and Teddy that made everything go so smoothly. Uh, I can tell you it wasn't without a few butterflies thinking about doing an online conference like this. And I'm so pleased the way it worked. Uh, I, I still would like to have an in-person meeting next year, but I think the link to have a uh, extension beyond that with a, a, a combination of in-person and uh, webinar maybe is the way of the future. So as much as the pandemic has caused a lot of bad things for, for many of us, we are learning certain things and we're, we're going to come out of this strong and I know that's been repeated earlier. So from all of you, uh, I want to say thank you for coming and to our team who did this and the University of Manitoba 
who ultimately is the body that supported all this. And it is the role of the university to try to move ideas forward and to increase the understanding of, of important issues. And I feel that this is one of the ways in which the university gives back to the community as well. So with that, I would say thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see all of you next year. And uh, bye for now. Oh, thank you.